Happening now, we hear from Jamestown City Council as they discuss no-knock search warrants and the future of police body cameras here locally. Plus, state officials are still waiting to hear more from five local school districts about their plan to reopen this fall. And sun and clouds will be sharing the afternoon sky today with a couple afternoon showers to go through. I've got the details next as the news at noon starts now. Live and on demand, this is WNY News Now. And thanks for joining us for WNY News Now. I'm Justin Gould. The discussion regarding the possibility of purchasing more body cameras for the Jamestown Police Department turned into talks about the idea of no-knock search warrants during a Jamestown City Council work session meeting last night. First Ward Councilman Brett Sheldon asked Acting Police Chief Tim Jackson about certain situations that officers don't use body cameras, such as the execution of a no-knock warrant. Take a listen. I do have a question about the exceptions uh, when executing a search warrant, uh, that the body cameras would not be used during no-knock warrants, nighttime search warrants, forensic evidence collection search warrants, and where property has already been seized or in police custody of control. That, that's currently in the, the order right now, correct? That, that, that was added. To the body that camera. Was added. Okay. Yes. Can you explain why, uh, especially the no-knock warrants, um, they wouldn't be wearing a body camera or using the body camera at that point? Those are typically done um, for safety reasons. Number one, wearing them would be difficult. Uh, no-knock warrants are typically done by a SWAT team, an emergency, or drug, something to that effect. That phrase, no knock warrant, has really, you know, gotten to people's minds after the Breonna Taylor uh, yeah. murder on Louisville. Uh, yeah. So that's why I'm concerned about that one. Because mm -hmm. yeah, there was no body cam footage from that, from what I, I'm aware of. But that's typical, though, in most police departments, would you say? Correct. Yes. Okay. Do we do a lot of no-knock warrants? We haven't done a lot this year. So that, that one kind of made me a little nervous, too, after, you know, Brianna Taylor, you know. I understand the reasoning, but... Um, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> You know. How many no-knock warrants would be typical? You know, how many on average would the city conduct in a year? I know you said we haven't done many, but what would a typical average be? I would say it could range from 12 to 24. Hmm. And those are thoroughly you searched because you know, when you when you think about Brianna, that one was it just seemed like it was a lot of human error that caused that situation. So, I'm, but I'm sure you guys, you know, your professionals and um, that the proper um, information you have the proper information when you um, are executing that. I'm sorry, Councilwoman James. I can. I'm not really know what I'm really at, what I wanted to say. You know, I just wanted to make sure that. You know, because it seemed like in Bri with Brianna Taylor, that was a lot of seemed like human error um, in there. Yes. And so um, with ours, I just would hate to see you know something like that happen here with human error. And I'm just going to I'm giving you the benefit that you guys are professionals and that you make sure that you have the correct information before this is executed. Absolutely. <laughs> Just for the uh, yeah. just, just for the just for the record, uh, I served on the SWAT team with uh, Chief Jackson, um, and executed uh, uh, in my career hundreds of uh, no-knock warrants. Obviously, the concern uh, uh, not using 
a no knock warrant is if you're uh, trying to if you're going after drugs, it gives someone the time to flush and get rid of all the drugs. Or the other concern is is an officer safety issue. Um, if you are knocking on the door and you're announcing yourself, then that gives uh, can give someone inside the house the opportunity to uh, obtain a weapon and uh, possibly uh, start shooting at the SWAT team when they do enter uh, enter the residence. Um, and obviously, like um, uh, Councilwoman James said, I mean, it comes down to uh, training and professionalism. And I have the uh, utmost confidence in, in Chief Jackson um, in that training uh, of his SWAT team. Thank you, Councilman Russell. Now, council leaders say more discussion on purchasing additional body cameras for police detectives will continue. The group is concerned about where specifically funding for buying that equipment will come from. A man has been arrested in connection with a shooting yesterday afternoon on Prendergast Avenue in Jamestown. Jamestown police allege during an altercation with several people, 27-year-old George Medina Tarando pulled out a pistol and fired several rounds, striking a male victim twice. That victim was taken to UPMC Chautauqua Hospital in a private vehicle before being helicoptered to UPMC Hammett for serious injuries. Now, as of last check, police say that man was undergoing surgery. Police say Medina Tarando was arrested at an address nearby. Investigators later recovered the loaded weapon in a wooded area where the shooting occurred. Now, he's being charged with first-degree assault and second-degree possession of a weapon with additional charges pending. And there are more than 5 million known cases of COVID-19 here in the United States, that according to John Hopkins University. One group that has seen a notable rise in U.S. infections are children, our John Lawrence explains. Public health officials warned about opening schools in states with COVID-19 hotspots, but others want students back in class. For the most part, they do very well. I mean, they, they don't get very sick. They don't catch it easily. They don't get very sick. In terms of the risk to school kids, um, this is lower risk than seasonal influenza. However, medical experts say having youth in crowded hallways and classrooms poses a significant threat. You're waiting for a second fire to erupt. You're pouring fuel on a raging fire. More than 800 students in Georgia's Cherokee County are in quarantine due to possible coronavirus exposure. This one week after in-person learning began. We are not out of the woods yet and we cannot take our foot off the gas. I'm asking that all Georgians continue to remain vigilant as we continue this fight. Over the past four weeks, there's been a 90% hike in known COVID-19 cases among U.S. children, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association. We think we're going to see an explosion of cases in September that will far surpass what we saw after Memorial Day and that this is just going to continue to increase and getting higher and higher in terms of numbers. I'm John Lawrence reporting. John, thank you. The report from the AAP and the CHA is expected to be revised weekly. Its data comes from state health departments in 49 states, New York City, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and Guam. Researchers say an effective testing strategy would be to help communities properly determine if and when to reopen schools for in-person teaching. And speaking of, five area school districts have yet to submit their fall reopening plan to New York State. Governor Andrew Cuomo says Franklinville, Portville, Salamanca, West Valley, and Pine Valley schools were among 107 districts across the state that did not submit their plans by last week's deadline. The governor says districts that don't submit their plans by this Friday will not be allowed to provide in-person learning this year. He says state health officials are reviewing plans and will work with district leaders on incomplete submissions. The main arbiter here of whether a school district has an intelligent plan to reopen and whether people have confidence in that school district's plan 
it's going to be the parents and it's going to be the teachers. And that is requires discussion. And that's going to be a dialogue. You're not going to dictate to parents that they have to send their child. They don't have to send their child. Now, New York originally set July 31st as the deadline for the state's roughly 700 school districts to submit their plans to both the state health and education departments. The state education department says 86 school districts, including New York City, requested one-week extensions to submit their plans. Cuomo says that infection rates are low enough to allow schools to offer at least some in-person learning this fall. Well, we thank you for joining us here for WNY News Now as uh, we uh, make our way through another hot and steamy day out there. Got to say hello to Cindy. Good to see uh, Christopher on the broadcast. Good to see uh, Betsy, uh, Nicole, Laura, Walker, uh, and David as well. Thanks for joining us. Great to see Rob. Uh, Dave says, uh, happy birthday to Joseph. A big happy birthday to you. Thanks so much for joining us here. Good to see uh, Mike and uh, Chelsea as well. Hopefully everybody is having a uh, great day. Uh, we appreciate you uh, tuning in. Let us know uh, what you are thinking about in the comments down below. Well, now let's get a uh, check of our first defense weather forecast with uh, Chief Forecaster Dakota Hunter. And uh, Dakota, that shot behind you uh, looks uh, a little, little eerie out there. Yeah, and uh, we have a few clouds going through basically the afternoon today. And this is a tractor that is parked down here. It is not a pa 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 plower. Craig Morgan fans, anybody? Anyway, uh, this is a live look over Finley Lake. 77 is the current temperature. Look at the southwest wind at 12. So there is a little bit of a breeze out there today. So that'll help you. Here is a live look coming from downtown Jamestown from the top of the Doubletree Hotel. We've seen the camera kind of bounce a little bit in the wind. As of right now at the airport, we're at 76. Southwest wind at 10. Look at this uh, wind gust at 20. So it's going to help to feel a little bit better out there today. But the dew point's still up there at 66. So it's feeling more like 78 degrees out there. First defense Doppler is dry so far this uh, basically early this afternoon, but there will be a small chance for at least a shower or a storm through the afternoon in pop up nature. 83 uh, was the high yesterday. Only 67 is where we started the day this morning. So it was an AC on kind of night. So if you didn't have AC last night, eh, it was kind of hard to sleep. You were tossing and turning. Uh, 95 is the record high for this date set back in 1940 and 45 is the record low set back in 1987. So basically through the afternoon, sun and clouds are going to be mixed through the day today. Showers and storms will develop in scattered and random nature through the afternoon. Some of them could contain some uh, locally heavy downpours as well. Breezy 81 at the water to 87 well inland. West southwest wind averaging about 10 to 20 but wind gusts could be 30 to 35 miles per hour. We'll dry it out for a couple days and then the heat and the humidity return as we go into the weekend. I've got the details in a few. Justin. All right Dakota thank you. A Randolph woman was ejected from her pickup truck during a rollover crash in the westbound lane of I-86 near Randolph last night. New York State Police Captain Eric Balin tells WNY News Now the single vehicle crash happened around 6.15 after 47-year-old Sue Foster crashed her truck in the median. Now, through investigation, troopers believe the truck exited the south side of the roadway, rolled over, and partially ejected Foster. Balin says she was not wearing her seatbelt at the time of the crash and suffered serious injuries because of it. She was taken to a regional hospital via STAT medevac, and it appears that the pickup truck was hauling many items, including a washing machine. 96 westbound between Cold Spring and Randolph was closed for around an hour while crews worked that scene. Police have made an arrest following a shooting last week near the corner of Newland and Forest Avenues here in Jamestown. Police say 49-year-old Chris Freeney turned himself into officers yesterday after they issued a warrant for his arrest. It's alleged that following a dispute between several people last Thursday, Freeney pulled out a gun and fired into a parked car where several people were seated. Officers said none of the occupants were injured in the shooting and that the entire incident was captured on Jamestown Public Safety's camera located at the corner of Forest and Newland Avenues. Investigators say they were able to positively identify the shooter as Freeney and they issued in a warrant for his arrest. Freeney is charged with first degree menacing and is in city jail awaiting arraignment. Police say their investigation is continuing and additional charges are expected in the case. 
Coming up next, we tell you about a new law here in New York requiring all to buckle up. And later, we celebrate a holiday that cherishes family. Stay with us as WNY News Now continues. With coverage that matters, this is WNY News Now. EagleZip.com is your local one-stop shop for all of your home and business computer needs. Located on Fluvan Avenue Extension, just outside of Jamestown, EagleZip.com sells and services all brands of desktops and laptops, as well as servers and network equipment for your business. All new computer sales include transferring your data from your old computer, plus a two-year warranty. Call EagleZip.com today. Stop by EagleZip.com today and let us make computers easy for you. I grew up in a single parent home. We were raised by my mom in a one bedroom apartment in Queens and I slept in what was supposed to be a dining room just off the kitchen. We were poor and fell behind in our bills. More than once our electricity was shut off and there were eviction notices taped to our door. I remember walking into our kitchen and finding my mother standing by the stove crying to herself because she didn't know what to do and felt helpless. I was about nine or 10 when our apartment was robbed. I remember arriving home with my mother and brother and finding the door open, feeling confused because the first thing I saw was that our television, the, a set which forever sat on a stand in, in the living room was missing. I know firsthand what it's like to be a victim, to be assaulted, robbed, to have things taken from you which you're never going to get back, and to be scarred by experiences which 30 and 40 years later still haunt me. We're lucky enough to live in Chautauqua County where by and large we feel safe, but unfortunately bad things do happen here. I want to be the district attorney who personally prosecutes the most serious crimes and who's there for victims every step of the way. These are the people I want to represent, to fight for their justice, to fight for our justice in the courtroom, to help people who have suffered at the hands of others. This is why I want to be your district attorney. You're watching WNY News Now, where coverage comes first. And welcome back. New York's governor signed a new seatbelt law today that now requires all passengers in a vehicle to buckle up. Governor Andrew Cuomo says it's been known for decades that seatbelts save lives, and with the new measure, the state is hoping to prevent needless tragedies. Back in 1984, under Governor Mario Cuomo, New York became the first state to pass a mandatory seatbelt law. And by 2008, 24 years after the law was enacted, the compliance rate was up to 98%. Currently, passengers ages 16 and older are only required to wear a seatbelt when in the front seat. The Governor's Traffic Safety Committee has indicated 30% of highway deaths in New York are occupants unrestrained by a seatbelt. Safety experts believe that the use of a backseat seatbelt could prevent over two-thirds of fatalities here in the state. The new law takes effect on November 1st. Well, chaos outside the White House yesterday as the president's coronavirus briefing was briefly interrupted after Secret Service responded to shots fired nearby. White House correspondent Whitney Wilde is there with the latest. It's hopefully soon. Minutes into a press briefing. Excuse me. The president abruptly escorted from the podium. Excuse me. The White House placed on lockdown after shots were fired across the street near Lafayette Square. President Trump returned moments later to address the incident. There was a shooting outside of the White House and seems to be very well under control. There was an actual shooting and uh, Somebody's been taken to the hospital. I don't know the condition of the person. It seems that the person was was shot by Secret Service. Despite the unnerving situation, the president says he wasn't concerned for his safety. I feel very safe. And quickly moved on to face questions from reporters on a number of issues, including his pitch to sign an executive order to protect people with pre-existing conditions, despite the fact coverage is already guaranteed under the Affordable Care Act. Just to let people know that the Republicans are totally 
strongly in favor of pre-existing condition, taking care of people with pre-existing conditions. The president also touted a series of controversial executive actions he issued over the weekend after stimulus talks between the White House and lawmakers stalled. A lot of money will be going to a lot of people very quickly. But the administration says they're still open to a deal. Anytime they want to meet and they're willing to negotiate and have a new proposal, we're more than happy to meet. At the White House, I'm Whitney Wild. All right, Whitney, thank you. Now, speaking of those stimulus talks, both sides are signaling a possible return to negotiations this week. Now, critics of the president's executive order say some jobless Americans may never see that extra $400 simply because states don't have enough money to meet federal requirements. In fact, lawmakers say Congress has been asked to provide $500 billion to help cover state budgets. A new study suggests that overdose deaths might be underreported. The study, published in the journal Analysis of Internal Medicine, found that more than one in six deaths were mistakenly classified as out-of-hospital cardiac arrests, or OHCA, when they were actually caused by a overdose. The study's authors say that's when emergency medical services have a first impression of a cardiac arrest and there's no history or signs of a drug overdose. To develop their findings, researchers looked at hundreds of deaths in San Francisco County. They say this overdose rate is specific to that area, but point out San Francisco's overdose mortality rate is nearly identical to the median overdose mortality rate among other states. Well, the Toronto Blue Jays are scheduled to play their first home game at Salem Field in Buffalo tonight. The team arrived in Buffalo last night. Now referred to as baseball's nomads, the Jays were on the hunt for a new home after Canada's government wouldn't let them play in Toronto because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now they were going to call PNC Park in Pittsburgh home until Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf said no. Well, that left Buffalo, which last hosted a regular season Major League Baseball game in 1915 when the Buffalo Blues finished sixth in the eight-team Federalist League. The wait hasn't been quite as long for the Jays, though. Toronto spent the first two-plus weeks bouncing from Tampa to Washington to Atlanta to Boston, waiting for preparations at, 16, uh, at the 16,000-seat field to be completed. However, no fans will be seated. Because of the pandemic, the game will be only televised on Fox Sports Florida and Sports Net 1. Certainly exciting, nevertheless, uh, for a lot of people here in Western New York who maybe are baseball fans. It's just too bad uh, that we're not able to see it in person, Dakota. However, uh, from what I can hear is it's going to be a, a pretty good night for them. The thing is, too, you know, you can't go to Buffalo and you cannot stand on the uh, parking lot that goes to the one Seneca Tower. They're going to have, uh, um, you know, I think they're going to have police there. Just don't even do it. Just don't do that. I mean, I know a lot of people want to see it, but don't try to roam around Buffalo and try to sneak a peek. So talking about the forecast tonight, bam, that baseball, there it goes. Now I'm airing on the drier side of things, especially in Buffalo tonight, 80 around the first pitch comes up at 637 tonight. So I'm going around 80, should still be mostly sunny at that point, but it's still going to be a warm and muggy night though. Temperatures only dipping off into the mid seventies, but it should be dry. There has been a little chatter about maybe an isolated shower, but I didn't even put it in here because I think it it should be a mainly dry night. So go Blue Jays. Here we go with the temperature 76 here in town, 77 in Mayville, 76 in Clamor. Now all the ones in orange are coming from the New York State Mesonet and all these update every five minutes here. 77 in Brant, 76 in Fredonia. But bigger story once again is the dew point. It's still up there mid to upper 60s across much of the area. 65 in Clamor, 66 in town, 66 also in Randolph. So when the dew point gets up there in the mid to upper 60s, that's when you start to feel it. Hey, also something peaks this week the Perseid meteor shower. So let's talk about this here. The comet of origin is going to be the swift turtle uh, origin of the comets tonight. And uh, the uh, and uh, the uh, shower has actually been active since the 17th of July, and it will run all the way until August 20th. And uh, the peak meteor count, we could see up to 100 meteors per hour, and the actual terminal velocity of the meteors could be up to 37 miles per second. And the peak time is going to be tonight all the way through Thursday. Now, 
I don't think we're going to have a good shot of seeing this tonight. I think the better shot's probably going to come tomorrow, but we'll see on that. Satellite and radar composite, we have a front that's knocking on our back door. So as this front moves through, you know what that's going to do. The humidity is going to drop for tomorrow. Thank goodness, but we got to push this front through the area right now. And actually there was a long lasting derecho that occurred from Illinois uh, across uh, basically much of the Midwest, over 700 miles of uh, straight line damaging winds with wind gusts over 100 miles per hour. Lots of damage out there, but we spared from that. Here we go with future scan. Future scans not being impressed with the rain today. And it's actually painting most of the uh, shower activity well to the north. I think there's going to be a few pop ups across the southern tier, but again, Again, it's a small chance, 30 to 40 percent. So, but again, if one does pop up, there could be some heavy rainfall. Uh, embedded within it. An early shower ends tonight, then tomorrow we get into lots of sunshine, and I think tomorrow is going to be your best bet to see the Perseid meteor shower, and obviously you know what to do. Get away from the city lights, get out in the country, and uh, see if you can see it out there. Uh, inland areas today, lower 80s today, but it's going to be feeling a lot more warmer than that uh, when you actually add in the humidity. Lake Erie shoreline, again, cooler spot today, lower 80s, right at the water, and uh, lots of sunshine, but it will be breezy. How about the future? The next seven days of your life on Planet Earth are right there. 81 tomorrow, less humid because the cold front will move through. Then we spike the humidity up again on Thursday, 85, but should be mainly dry. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, afternoon showers and storms with high humidity once again. Another storm system moving our way Monday may bring us more widespread showers and storms as it looks now upper 70s. We'll take a break. Be right back. You're watching WNY News Now, your source for breaking news. There's an old saying, there's no news in the newsroom. Well, it's true. The time I spend at the anchor desk is just part of my day. Most of our time is spent gathering stories in the community, stories that matter to you. We can't do it alone, and we need your help. When you see breaking news or have a news tip we should know about, drop us a line on Facebook today. Email our news desk or call our newsroom at 488-7226 so we can bring those stories straight back to you. You're watching WNY News Now, where coverage comes first. And welcome back. Today is National Sons and Daughters Day. To mark the day, you can hang out with your kids if you're a parent, go for a walk at the local park, or even maybe catch a movie at a drive-in. Now, if your kids are grown and have flown the nest, give them a call and tell them why they're special. If you aren't a parent, you're still a son or daughter. Maybe call your mom or dad and take them out for dinner if you can. Certainly, uh, big thanks to a lot of parents out there uh, who make a, a really big difference in their kids' lives. And got to give a shout out to mine. Uh, certainly wouldn't be doing this without their support. Uh, Got to say hello to Tom. Good to see Danielle. Uh, Raymond, thanks so much for joining us. Great to have you here on the broadcast. Uh, uh, good afternoon to uh, Andrea as well and uh, Danielle. Hopefully everybody is having a good day. Great to see Howard too. Thanks so much for joining us today. That is going to do it for this edition of WNY News Now at Noon. Of course, we remind you we're back here tomorrow at noon with a look at all the local news headlines that matter to you. When you're on the go, you can stay in the know by downloading our mobile app. Just search W1Y News Now in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. We'll leave you with this live shot over Chautauqua Lake. Have a great day.